Hey everyone, Dr. Yi here. Today we're going to look at another lesson. We're going to learn about properties of substances. You should have a knowledge of density, what density is, and how you can use density to identify different substances. Uh, next, you should know the properties of water. So water, as a very unique substance, has quite a few characteristics. Uh, so for example, solubility, cohesion, adhesion, we'll go over each of these properties. Next, you should be able to identify a substance using characteristics from a chart of given properties. So basically, these may give you a chart, a table with you know, numbers for different physical chemical properties, and you need to be able to use that information to identify an unknown substance. Lastly, you can compare and contrast osmosis and diffusion. So osmosis is the movement of water molecules and diffusion is um, a, a more kind of broad type of molecular movement where molecules can move from high concentration area to a lower concentration area. So osmosis is a really kind of special type of diffusion, is diffusion of water molecules. All right, now let's look at physical property. So physical properties um, really kind of refer to something that you can observe, right? Now physical properties can change without changing the identity of substances. For example, if you look at water, water can be water vapor or the common you know, water liquid or water can be in the ice form, right? Solid form. Those are all uh, different physical properties, right? But you can see they can change, but no matter what, this substance is still water, right? The, the identity of the substance does not change, even though the physical characteristics change. Now, there are two groups of physical properties, intensive physical property and extensive physical property. Now, intensive physical properties remain the same, remain the same regardless of the amount of substance. Basically, it doesn't matter how much substance you have, these physical properties will be the same. Examples are boiling point, melting point. So it doesn't matter how much water you have, whether you have a one gram of water or a thousand grams of water, the boiling point for water is still the same, right? It does not change. The boiling water, oops, the boiling point of water is still 100 degree Celsius, right? Extensive physical properties can change depending on how much substance you have. For instance, mass, right? Mass is basically the weight of the substance. So uh, it definitely depends on the amount of substance. Volume, right? the less substance you have, the less volume it is. And the more substance you have, the more the volume is. So I made a table to kind of summarize some of the common physical properties with their definitions. So you have an idea what each property is about, because you may see uh, one question on physical properties of substances. The most important one is density because it is used a lot in real life. Density is the ratio of mass to volume. For example, um, if you have one gram of water and you measure the volume, which is, let's say, one mil, the density is going to be mass, one gram, divided by the volume, right? The ratio of mass to volume. So that will be the density one gram per meal for water. Density is an intensive physical property, right? It doesn't matter how much substance you have, the density will remain the same. Whether you have, you know, one gram of water or 100 grams of water, the density of water will be the same. Boiling point, this is the temperature at which a liquid boils and it changes to gas phase. You probably see this a lot in daily life, but when you boil water, right, uh, you can see there's a weight, water vapor, water vapor, you know, the steam 
coming up, and that's because water reaches the boiling point, and the liquid water converts to the, the water vapor. Melting point. This is the temperature at which a solid melts and changes to liquid phase. So it's pretty straightforward and not too much to talk about there. So you can think of, you know, certain metals when they get really hot, they are going to melt. Right? Next, we're going to look at specific heat capacity. So the definition is a little bit long, so just bear with me. Specific heat capacity refers to the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a one gram of a particular substance by one degree Celsius. Um, basically, this is really about how much heat you need to provide to raise the temperature of a one gram of a particular substance by one degree Celsius. If you have, let's say, one gram of water, the initial temperature is 10 degrees Celsius, and you want to provide heat to raise the temperature. And the amount of heat that's required to raise the temperature from 10 degrees Celsius to 11 degrees Celsius would be the specific heat capacity for water. Now, the specific heat capacity, just like um, the other physical properties on this table, is an intensive physical property, meaning it's unique to this particular substance. It's not affected by how much substance you have. So it does not change. I found the table to kind of uh, give you some examples of specific heat capacity for different substances, and hopefully this will kind of help you understand the definition. So you can see this is a table with the different substances on the left, and then the heat, uh, the specific heat capacity is on the right. Now, the numbers are based on one kilogram of substance. Right? Previously, we use one gram in the definition. So these numbers are slightly different. This is based on you know, how much heat you need to provide to raise the temperature by one degree for a kilogram of a particular substance. So we can use either of the two columns, they're the same. So we can look at the joules, uh, which is this column right here. So you can see for water, this is the amount of heat or energy that you need to provide to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree. And you can see it's a lot higher than the rest of the substances. When we get to the water property, we will mention this again. Water has a very high specific heat capacity. So in comparison, let's say if you compare water with, let's say, some kind of metal, let's say copper, because some of the cookware is made of uh, copper, right? So let's say you are using a copper pot to heat up water. You're providing heat to both substances. You probably remember that the copper pot always heats up a lot faster. And that's because copper has a much lower specific heat capacity. If you provide the same amount of heat to both the copper and the water, so let's say, let's say we provide 3,000 joules of heat to both copper and water. Let's say the weight of the pot and water is the same. So you can see with this much of heat, the copper will increase in temperature by almost 10 degrees, right? But for water, it's less than one degree. So water heats up a lot slower than uh, a pot made of copper. So water is very resistant to temperature change. And this is why that um, coastal cities that are um, next to a large body of water have mild weather, right? The temperatures remain more or less the same. They don't change too dramatically. And that's because the, the water body it can really hold a lot of heat without changing the temperature. And so that's what causes the relatively mild weather, right? less temperature fluctuation. And this 
particular um, characteristic also enables water to be a very good medium for our body, right? Our body has a lot of water um, with the high specific heat capacity. Our body is better at maintaining temperature homeostasis, right? Because you don't want the body temperature to change too much. So in addition to a lot of the mechanisms for temperature homeostasis, such as you know behavior, such as sweat, um, water itself, water in our body can also resist temperature change by itself. The conductivity is about the degree to which a specific material conducts electricity. So, so basically, it's how well a material can conduct electricity. Right? When we need, you know, material to make uh, wires, right? We want the material to have high conductivity, right? So it can conduct electricity better. All right. Now, all the physical properties in this table are intensive physical properties, meaning these properties do not change whether how much substance you have. If you have a one gram of copper, the conductivity is, um, I'm just going to make up some number, let's say five. I know it's not right, but just for simplicity. And if you have a 10 grams of copper, the conductivity is still five, right? Because it's the same substance, which is copper. The amount does not affect the specific conductivity for copper. Next, chemical property. So chemical property is based on chemical reactivity of a substance. We talk about the number of electrons in the valence shell and how that relates to chemical reactivity of a substance. If you have eight electrons in the valence shell, you are stable, right? You tend to not react with other substances. But if you have you know, less than eight electrons in the valence shell, atoms tend to be reactive. They're trying to either lose or gain or share electrons to get to the eight or two in the valence shell, right, to satisfy the octet rule. Chemical reactions often lead to formation of new substances. And this will change the identity of the original substances. We talk about the digestive system and a bunch of enzymes that are used by our body to digest or break down different types of biomolecules. If you remember in the saliva, we have amylase, but of course you can find amylase in the small intestine as well to digest the starch. But amylase is a, a, an enzyme that can break down starch and specifically amylose. So amylose is a type of starch. Amylase, you see A-S-E indicates this is an enzyme. O-S-E indicates this might be a sugar, right, which is a type of carbohydrate. So amylase breaks down amylose, a type of starch, to a disaccharide. Di means two, right? So maltose has two single sugar units connected. So those, two, those single sugar units are called monosaccharides, mono. So monosaccharides are the um, building blocks of carbohydrates, right? So two monosaccharides uh, join together and they form a disaccharide. So in this case, amylose will be broken down to maltose. And now you can see because of this chemical reaction, there is new substance forming, right, from the original substance. The original substance is amylose, but after the chemical reaction, you won't be able to find amylose anymore. Instead, you're going to find the new substance, which is maltose, right, resulting from the chemical reaction. Now, now let's look at some practice problems. Number one, copper is a metal with high thermal and electrical conductivity. Which of the following describes such property of copper? Now, these properties are physical properties, right? We talk about high, uh, we talk about thermal uh, capacity, which is the same as heat capacity. We talk, about, we talk about conductivity. So those are physical properties, so not chemical properties. And this has nothing to do with density, right? The heat capacity, conductivity, there are totally different physical properties than density. Now, how about extensive properties? So which one do I choose between A and C. 
So extensive property changes depending on the mass and volume of the substance, right? Basically how much um, of the substance is present, how much do you have? So the heat capacity, the electrical conductivity, those properties do not change regardless how much copper you have, right? So those properties will remain the same, something very unique to copper substance. So they are intensive physical properties. So C is not correct. So the answer will be A. Next one, copper is a metal when weathered and exposed to air or seawater oxidizes to a green pigment. Which of the following describes such property of water? And you can see oxidizes. This keyword gives you a clue. Oxidizes, this is probably some kind of chemical reaction. And also it, you know, it gives you this information. Now copper changes to a green pigment. Right? So this is the formation of a new substance. So what kind of uh, property will lead to a new substance? Chemical reaction, chemical property. Okay, correct answer is 